morning and good evening for friends who are joining us from the States. Uh, my name is Narumon Wang Nai. I'm the senior program specialist of AT Extension, Asian Institute of Technology. I would like to welcome you all to the, our webinar on the di dialogic change for HR professionals. Uh, before we start the session, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Warawe Cholosin, uh, our executive director, to give a few messages. Uh, Mr. Warawe, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, B. Uh... Uh, good evening, uh, Consulio, uh, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, maybe uh, to to everyone. Um, uh, we are very we are very pleased uh, that to have the speaker today with us. Um, one reasons or two reasons is because of um, the her background that I I went through the the bio is very interesting and also actually this background is part of the uh, businesses that AIT extensions my team basically is you know uh, doing every day every month and every year so it is going to be something is very interesting and for uh, those people who are interested in the HR areas uh, this may be another good opportunity for you to really open up uh, your you know, explorations in terms of the new ideas of the HR professional practice and also the HR, the human resource development as well. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming today, although now in the U.S. it's already late at night, but we are looking forward to not only this time, uh, Consulio, uh, we are also looking forward to really listening from your expertise again in the near futures, uh, we consider this as the year end, you know, celebration of our uh, webinar sessions that we have run for about uh, 25 webinar sessions for 2023. And we are going to do double of the webinar session for 2024. And obviously, U of Houston will be one of the uh, centers and specialization that we would like to uh, work closely for, especially in the area of the HR uh, education uh, that would help us to be able to offer the executive education programs, you know, human resource development, capacity development, professional executive, uh, professional developments in, in Asia and in Pacific and also for the uh, clientele. Uh, I also believe that uh, this subject is also very important for the HR professionals in corporate sectors. So we would like also to give the idea of the corporate sectors, what are the elements of the HR education, HR development, and also the uh, what you call the di di dialogic change for the HR professionals going to be, which is going to be very important. And we have to make it very fast so that we can cope with the uh, rapid change of the business landscape and also the interest of the global business landscape uh, as of as of we are facing today. Thank you so much. So with this message, I would like to uh, open these sessions and I would like the audience to uh, listening to this session very carefully and uh, make sure that you uh, keep some key takeaway that to bring back to your organization and also for my colleagues at AIT Extensions, uh, please take notes so that we can also discuss further uh, in the time to come that how we can also incorporate the same elements that shared by our speaker specialists today into our program. Thank you so much and welcome to the session. Uh, thank you, Kun Warovet, for your uh, welcome message. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Consuelo Wait. Um, Dr. Consuelo is a Professor of Human Resource Development of University of Houston. And she is also the founding director of the executive HRD program. Uh, she conducts research on learning merger and acquisition and global HRD. She teaches courses related to learning, dialogic, organization development and global HRD. She worked in many countries in Angola, Mozambique, Belize, Jamaica, including Thailand. 
ดรคอนซูเอโลเอิร์นเฮอร์พีเอชดีอินฮิวแมนรีซอสเดเวลลอปเมนต์ฟอร์มเดอะยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้ออฟอิลลินอยส์แอดเออร์บานาแชมเปญชีส์ออลโซเดอะลิซิเปียนออฟเอฟูบรายท์สตูเดนต์อวอร์ดแอนด์เอฟูบรายท์สคอลาอวอร์ด Now may I invite Dr. Consuelo to deliver her session. Dr. Consuelo, the floor is yours. Thank you, B. Thank you, uh, Mr. Volovarte, for um, for the welcome. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, converse with you today and learn with you. Um, B. One thing B did not mention is that uh, we met. At the University of, of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, we were both doing our PhDs at the same time, and that's uh, a very important um, note because um, five weeks ago I saw B in in Bangkok. Um, in addition to one of my other friends, um, so thank you. I I look forward to learning with you this this session. I I want to. Kind of make this conversation today a microcosm of what I'm, I will talk about, and subsequently, uh, please stop me at any time. You can add, a, you know, make an extension of what I've shared. You can ask questions. You can um, help me think. Um, so I, you know, it does this. It, you do not have to wait till the end. If there is something that emerges for you. Um, Please pause and and let the conversation emerge. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint, uh, but learning is not about me delivering what I have planned for you. Learning is if we, you, and I can get into dialogue, and in that dialogue, uh, you know, new ideas emerge, uh, new uh, opportunities emerge, a reflection for you or a reflection for me may emerge. So. Uh, Please consider engaging in the conversation um, as I go through the the PowerPoint. Um, again, I have come in with a planned approach to this learning experience, and so I have an objective. Uh, but again, I'm very my, one of my biggest um, passions is to allow learning to emerge. And so, while I do have a plan, we may not necessarily. Always achieve this objective. We may, you know, the conversation may go somewhere else. And please, you know, let it go there if you feel that that's what you need at that particular time. You know, part of the objective is to reflect uh, on our organizations. And I, when I think about organizations, please consider your home, your families as an organization. Consider your workplace as an organization. So. I know the emphasis is on the corporate space, but I also want you to reflect on your instrumentality. You know, what has socialized you? What 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 has been part of your development um, to this point where you are in your life? So, organizations think about organizations broadly. The workplace, yes, but also the home. Four things that I want to, to for us to do today is one is to, to talk about what what do I mean when I say organizations as dialogic spaces. For us to reflect, if we agree that organizations are dialogic spaces, then how do we go about triggering change when we look at organizations as the, as dialogue? Um, and then I, I will to share with you one specific. Uh, approach that can be used um, when we're thinking about triggering change through dialogue. And then we can also reflect. It's a plan, but this plan can be disrupted. So uh, if you want to jump in at any point in time, let me know. As we go through this conversation, I want you to be very reflective of your workplace, as I said earlier, or your home or both of those places. Uh, and I want you to think about how do, how do these characteristics show up in my particular work, in my workspace, but it also in my home. Um, okay, so when I, when I talk about our, the organization as a dialogic space, what do I mean? 
uh, one of the first characteristics of organizations as dialogic spaces is that organizations are meaning-making systems. That's a very powerful statement. And the reason I'm going to say this is if I reflect on me being raised as a professor at the University of Illinois, in the, in, I, 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 as I reflect on the courses that I took and how organizations were being presented to us as students, it was more of the traditional perspective, the organization as a structure, the organization as a system, the organization as a process, uh, the organization, maybe you can look at it through the lens of culture, you can look at it through the lens of mission and vision. So the more traditional space, but reflect on this, organizations are also meaning making systems. And we humans, in that organization, in collaboration with the artifacts, you know, what the, the mission and vision is an, like an artifact, for example, or the nonverbal form of how we communicate, the verbal, all of those things in those specific spaces are triggering meaning. And if we step back and we like and we ask ourselves, in this meeting, what was in, in this meeting that we that I just had today, what was the meaning making? What were some of the, the emergent themes that showed up? Many times we enter these conversations, but we don't go above them to, to make sense of what were some of the, the stories, the storylines that we that emerge as a result of this conversation? I'll give you an example. We recently underwent a merger between, I was in the College of Technology and we merged with the College of Engineering. So presently I'm in the College of Engineering and professors, all of us with PhDs, um, we are in the HR space, so we are not the engineers. And, and there is this conversation occurring around, um, should we stay with engineering? Should we go? But the conversation, when, when I went above the conversation, there was fear. There was the notion of protection. Like, well, maybe if we leave engineering, we could be who we used to be somewhere else. And when I, you know, listened to the to the conversation, and I was able to help them go above it and said, "Protection does not exist. We have already changed. There is no control of what will happen next. There's so many variables that are unknown to us." And, and the notion of protection, meaning that if we move as a department, we will remain as a department, that is also a fallacy because none of us know that. So the ability. In that conversation, there was meaning making occurring, meaning making that potentially we could, you know, remain who we used to be. And instead, this is an, it, it's not, a, it, it, it changes, it has occurred, continues to occur. But yet, we humans want to go where, what it used to be. And in the language that we're using, we're, we're either sharing that we are adapting to it or that we are in a way resisting it or hoping that it will be what it used to be. My example is not unique. If tomorrow morning you go into your organization and listen into that first conversation, what meaning making is occurring in this organization? And I'll share a little bit through the lens of HR. Another characteristic of the, the organization as a dialogic space is that reality and relationships are socially constructed. So reality is continuously changing. That's a, it's a beautiful way of looking at life. It's a beautiful way of looking at, at the organization. It's continuously changing. And that change sometimes happens when you get a, a, you know, a, a phone call and somebody calls you and said, you know, we had these things as our priorities, but now we will shift. We now need to go to number seven. Number seven becomes number one. That's a, the construction of reality. Things are changing continuously. And 
to, to be able to, to recognize that and then be able to identify it, how reality is constructing itself through relationships. And the relationship may be the employees internally, the relationship may be the organization in relationship to its industry. It may be the organization in relationship with the government, you know, the laws. There's multiple things that are impacting the organization and as a result of that, it's continuously constructing itself. Organizations as dialogic space, subsequently then, language matters. Language broadly defined matters. And I gave you the example of me listening into the conversation. Now I was part of the I was part of the meeting, but I was also as analyzing it. I was analyzing the conversation, going above it to under and identify what were the crucial narratives that were being produced within the conversation. So language matters. And some of sometimes we ourselves do not, cannot, are not aware of how the language that we're using is either excluding, including, providing agency, removing agency, giving autonomy, giving voice, the ability to add, to provide an idea, to share perce uh, uh, perception, go back again to our socialization as kids. How were we were raised at home? And, you know, I was raised in a collective space. Yes, I live in the United States. I work at the University of Houston, but I was raised in Belize, in Central America, very collective, top-down structure. Did I have a lot of agency as a kid? No. So language broadly matters, something to consider. What is the language? What meaning making is occurring as a result of the language within the conversation? Another characteristic of the organization as a dialogic space is if we are dial if if organizations are also meaning making, then how do we change? How do we trigger change in organizations? If we're going to trigger, if we're going to look at the organization as a dialogic space, then we would need to change the conversations. So creating change requires changing the conversations. Think about that. Uh, it may require changing the language. It may require, um, you know, doing a lot of, uh, providing a lot of spaces for conversations to occur where people are, are, are adding to that conversation, where people are providing uh, reflections of that conversation. The example I shared with you, there was a pause. When I was able to go above the conversation and said, here are some of the narratives, are the, these narratives are assumptions because none of us have control of where what will happen next. That was a reflective moment. And then people said, oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, we, we have no assurance that if we were to move from here somewhere else, that we would move as a department, that we would stay together. Th there is no reality. You know, it, it, you're, it, it is not, you don't know what's going to happen next. So change, creating change then requires changing conversations. Um, the next is people and systems organizations are continuously self-organizing. In our own reflections, our self-directed learning, uh, or learning in this medium, any informal learning or formal learning reflection triggers, you know, a way of thinking potentially, it triggers a way for you to show up differently. Um, and a new employee gaining confidence in the organization, for example, a new employee building that relationship, the way the employee showed up in the first meeting versus the way the employee showed up in the second meeting, where the first meeting was more of listening, but the second meeting, there was an inquiry, there was a question. There, that, that, there is an example there of self-organizing. The person is showing up differently and self-organizing is occurring continuously as we learn as we reflect as we evaluate as we synthesize as we make 
you know, connections, as we build relationships, there is this self-organization that is occurring. And the reactions to this, organizations as dialogic spaces. Anyone would like to add a, a perception to this? Any, or maybe you have heard this concept before. Any 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 comments? Any any additions? Uh, according to this slide, I I really buy uh, that the organization has changed a lot. Um, just uh, right before COVID and also after COVID, we have seen that that change. And and this this really is something that uh, you know sometimes we cannot predict and. And uh, these slight uh, items of the five item is something that we we kind of you know uh, having some hypothetic uh, ideas of each organization have to observe and also try to see which one that they have to focus. So I think this is something is helping me personally because uh, we have not been able to identify as yet because it's changing over time, every day, every hours and everything. So I, I think I agree with this you know observation from the research. And I call it chemistry, and it is important for the head of the business units to keep this in mind. And I think it's also for oneself also has to know that this change happening, and we have to prepare for that change. Thank you. Thank you for 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 sharing. I concur with you. Uh, COVID was an emergence. Uh, a lot of companies were unprepared to deal with COVID. I know uh, in my executive program, we have uh, an advisory board made up of senior vice presidents, uh, companies here in Houston. And uh, when we met via this medium, we met online for our meeting. And I asked them if COVID had been, a, if, if I forgot, a, if, a, if the word pandemic, back to language, if the word pandemic existed in, or was written in any of their risk management plans. And everybody said, absolutely not. Uh, they do, they I, all had I would serve, if I would also share, say for example, if uh, someone want to do a kind of a further research on this, uh, the, the okay. assumptions uh, assumptions that, that we perhaps has to explore, whether the perceptions of the government organizations, the perception of the government organization, how much they perceive this is could happen. Because this organization would regulate it, would be regulated by rule and regulation. And this is something that we might also have looked into it, you know, uh, speaker, because the business that we are doing today, especially in AIT extension or the activities or project that we're doing, dealing a lot with the public sectors. And sometimes yeah. when we are really giving them idea of change has to be made, you know, one of the major uh, priority that they have to consider is they have a, a role to play in terms of the rule and regulations. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and absolutely, because uh, nobody knows what the next you know the and we there there is data and we can you know get some ideas. Um, we can learn from the past, absolutely. Um, but you know, I concur with you as I shared in 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 with our board. Nobody had the word pandemic in their risk management, um, and so yes, it was a. Uh, COVID was an emergence and uh, it was a huge learning lesson for a lot of organizations. So we have uh, Ms. Uh, Carissa. Yes. Please turn the microphone for him. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Clarissa. Good morning, now. I'm Clarissa from AAT Solutions. I just want to affirm this dialogic space for the last prime of my life being an HR practitioner. I always believe that whatever system changes, whatever things that will come, flood, whatever it is, fortuitous event, dialogical approach is always the most effective one. Because yeah. sometimes as extra practitioner, we go beyond policies. When the first thing that we have to do is to conduct dialogue with the person. When the things yes. are already understood between, us and among the organizations, then system can be easily understood. And I would like to thank you for um, affirming this to all of us who are practicing this kind of task in our lives or in our career. Thank you, Clarissa. And thank you also for coming in and for contributing. 
Um, I concur with you that, that, that in essence, when we're triggering change, giving uh, our employees voice is a big part of facilitating the change. Um, right. I want to come back to organizations as meaning-making systems. And to your point, Clarissa, thinking about meaning-making systems that exist within the HR organization. So when we look when we look at the HR organization and how does the HR organization trigger meaning-making? Um, and, and again, going back to the characteristics of language and conversation, when we look at the existence of language, you know, the more of the concrete spaces that that the HR organization, you know, in a way, leads and supports policies and procedures trigger meaning making. If we do it well and recognize that policies, you know, writing a policy is not a piece of paper. Uh, this is a passive, passive document. In essence, we want policies and procedures to be living documents, to be embedded in behavior. And if we are to do that, then how do, if, similarly, if I were to choose to acquire Thai as a language, then how would I go about with that language acquisition? Similarly, in the organizations, policies and procedures are not manuals that, yes, there, you know, it's a medium, but how do we enact the policies and procedures into behaviors? It would have to be facilitated through some form of language acquisition. And if I'm going to learn a language, I would have to practice that language. And how do I practice that language would be probably, you know, interactions back to relationship, back to conversations. The question is then, when there is a policy change, how is that enacted within the organization? If we do it via email, that's just the medium. But in essence, it probably did not translate into any form of learning or behavior. So something to consider. So HR, the meaning-making system with policies and procedures. Another way how meaning-making occurs in organizations is mission and vision statements. The mission and vision statement, you know, have a language, have a way of how we should think about the organization. They connote a, 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 the direction of that organization, what that organization values. If we add the value statements, all of those things are also meaning-making systems, and they are all, you know, created with language. Uh, Another space of meaning making for the HR organization is how HR does its work. If HR is more tactical, in the United States, they say if HR is a pair of hands, a pair of hands meaning that you, that HR spends a lot of its time focused on execution, 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 and probably in the language, there's a lot of, we're, oh, well, we'll have these projects. Oh, I'm implementing this program. If that's the language that HR owns, that there's a meaning making space there. And that means that HR is, you know, more tactical. HR can also be on a continuum between tactical and strategic. And if HR is being strategic, there is also a language that HR is evoking that HR is you know, using as it communicates with employees, as it communicates with senior leaders. Um, part of that language may be profit and loss, uh, you know, able to make sense of that. Part of that language may be what the key performance indicators are, what the quarterly report indicators are. Part of that language may be, you know, what are the manufacturing issues you know, how can we help manufacturing meet its key targets through strategic building strategic capability? And then therein lies the tactical, because if we are going to help, help manufacturing with its strategic capability, there may be some process issues, there may be some, some system issues, there may be some people capacity building opportunities, but therein is meaning making. And that meaning making transcends because then employees feel you know there is a feeling there is a tone about how what hr represents in the organization and sometimes you can hear 
you know, how empl employees experience HR. And it may be hiring, maybe HR, but through its own meaning-making system, HR sends the message, we are a hiring and firing organization, or, hey, we are a partnership in this organization. We listen. Back to your point, Clarissa, if they're listening, if HR is a, is a listener, then there is conversations. Uh, they allow employees to bring ideas, to share ideas. Is HR accountable? Is it results oriented? Can, it, can they tell their story of impact? Embedded in that way of working is also a meaning making system. And, you know, meaning making is generated by the, the multiplicity of interactions that are occurring in that organization. HR's influence with senior leaders. Uh, what does credibility look like? There is meaning making system also in sitting at the table, asking a question, you know, helping these senior leaders think about what they're considering for the next strategy. Um, I have a friend who works as for, she's not working for Google, but she worked for a major ph pharmaceutical in, in Chicago. She, there would be absolutely no strategy meeting without she sitting at the table. And she would literally help vice presidents think about the execution of those strategies through strategic capability. And sometimes she would say, we, you know, we got to pass that or we need this, we need that. To, and to be able to enact these things and then help those senior vice presidents prioritize among themselves what would happen first, what would happen next. So the HR, how the HR organization works, they're also, they are meaning-making systems in how the work gets done because behind that work, there is a language. Um, notions and treatment of HR professionals agency how you know how do we give voice and I, i'm just using one example here but junior employees junior hr and colleagues how soon can they contribute to the to the conversation how soon can they add a perception how soon can they ask a question that's very that's a reflective piece because that junior employee is bringing a perspective that a senior HR professional may not have. So giving voice, what voice do they have? What space is provided for that, for that junior employee or HR professional to experiment, to provide ideas, um, to help think through a particular problem? Um, and then how are senior HR professionals learning from junior colleagues? Mm -hmm. Or in any, any particular department, how are the senior leaders learning from the junior employees? Or is it you just arrived, you don't know anything, you know, uh, you should know your place. Therein is also a language. It's a meaning-making system. And remember that language is not always oral. It can be nonverbal. If you're sitting around the conference table with your junior employee and there is a meeting and only the people who've been there for a year plus, you know, contributed to that conversation, but that junior employee said nothing. Mm -hmm. And no one, nobody around that table provided the space mm -hmm. for that person to add that non that nonverbal behavior was also a language, and what meaning did you transcend as a result of the silence, the in lack of involvement, or the you know in lack of inclusion? It, HR is in its own organization is also a dialogic space, and that to be able to see ourselves in the mirror. And say what language? How do how does our language facilitate inclusion? Um, allow people to add value, to bring ideas, to help people, mm -hmm. to help us think. 
you know, one of the things that my vice presidents always say is everybody thinks that because we're the senior leaders in the organization that we know everything. And, and they said, if they, you know, we don't know everything. We are struggling as much as the line employee is struggling. Um, and sometimes the language, senior vice president, we give it sometimes a lot of stature and a lot of, of um, you know, value. But at the, behind that title is a human that does not fully understand or like all of us don't understand what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we're all in that self-organization. We're all in that adapting space. And think about the collective intelligence that can be generated if we were, are able to bring more voices into that conversation. Something to think about. Another language, another meaning-making system is the business. So they, you have the HR organization and then you have the rest of the organization, the business. How many languages exist in your organization? What is HR's competency with these languages? There is an, if you are a manufacturing engineering organization, there is an engineering language. There is manufacturing language. Their marketing has its own language. How, how we enter those spaces to make sense of the, the meaning making that these groups are you know, creating every day, the language they use. And what narratives as a result of the conversations in these specific spaces, then what are the emergent narratives? What are the storylines that exist across the business? So in essence, you, know, you have to be alert, conscious of the storylines, the narratives, and most powerfully, who are the main actors behind these narratives and storylines? We're talking about change and all of us. And I'll give you an example. In my when I was being when you know my, when I was a kid, we didn't have opinions. We, we were not given the choice to to even choose which outfit we were going to use put put on to go to school. On the other hand, my friend who was raised in Minnesota, his dad is a professor. By the way, his dad does a lot of work in Thailand. Um, Dr. Gary McLean, you, some of you may have heard about him. He was raised where in a democracy at home, where if there was a vacation, and I, I thought it was fabulous. It, you know, to, if they're going to go on a vacation, his dad would create surveys and he would put all the potential places they could go. And each kid, each kid would get a survey and then they would bring back their survey and he would tally the results, bring everyone in the living room and there would be a, a post, a post, you know, piece of paper and he would shoot in the results of where they would go to, on vacation per the, per the democrat, democratic voice that he had provided. So it's it's a, you know, who's leading the narrative um, is, very, is very important because that means then, does that reflect 1% of the organization? Does it reflect 50%? Allstate, for example, when I did, when I was doing my PhD at Allstate, we did a project, an e-learning project with Allstate. It was fabulous to see how they would bring people from all different parts of the organization. And they, you know, as the organization was dealing with issues, problems, emerge opportunities, they'd bring minds, minds from across the organization, put them in a task force and let them talk about it, let them converse about how the organization should resolve this um, or, you know, what the organization should do. If you're only having the narratives top down where one person is saying, this is how we're going to do it. This is how, are we losing on the intelligence? Are we losing, you know, on the ideas? And are we alienating at the same time because we're not engaging the voices? Another piece for the, for the business is what is the money-making language? If we're in, in the private sector, then the companies need to be sustainable, competitive, and the profit matters the money making matters so what is the language around that how does the organization make money and how does the organization lose money 
In our executive program, that's the first thing we talk about because therein lies data. They're in, in those two questions, you will only know the answers if you go look at the data. Um, uh, clearly, and in through conversations, you look at the data by talking to the CFO, by talking to the, your VPs, and then therein emerges the strategic aspect because therein leaders, those two, tri- two things will trigger leaders. How do we continue making more money? How does the organization, how is this organization losing money right now? And then back to the question, uh, I think uh, um, the first speaker, I I forgot, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but you mentioned the government, how the the public sector, there's always also languages that exist outside of the organization, the government, the industry, globally, the market. The customers, if you're selling a service or product, probably you, you know, are being talked about on social media. You you have reviews. There's a language there also about the organization. How do you make sense of that? All of these different groups of, of people are triggering meaning making for your organization. Okay, I'm going to move on. Now that we have become reflective that at home as children, we also were raised in dialogic spaces and in the organization, we exist in dialogic spaces. So then reflection is then, if organizations are dialogic spaces, then how do we go about implementing change? Can we implement change by telling, this is how we're gonna do it. A group of people identify the, the intervention and they start executing it. Would that work then if we are dialogic spaces? To implement, to, to, if we are gonna implement change, understanding that organizations that are dialogic spaces, then how we think is gonna be significant. Mindset is, is powerful in then in how we go about implementing change. And then we have approaches, tools that we could put, use to execute on, on the change. And this is this is powerful. Back to COVID. COVID was not a technical problem. COVID was an adaptive challenge. But a lot of leaders have been developed, socialized in academic programs to only look at the organization as a technical space to only look at the organization as, and that's how I was raised, by the way, as an, you know, you know, in my program, I felt like it was, I, everything that, that the organization was dealing with was always going to be something that I could solve, that I could, you know, execute a change, a program, and then there would be a solution. But to the point made per COVID, AI, for example, right now, Are those things technical? They're evolving. They're emerging. And so it's adaptive. It's not something that we can put in a box and say, this is how we're going to do this. It's complex. And we need collective intelligence. We need collective voices to help us think, to help us with our blind spots, to help us bring perspectives that we were never socialized to think about, for example. How I was raised, you know, thinking about creating change in organization was more of the planned approach. And B can 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 refer to this. We we read Cummings and Worley, and we this we say you do this first. You do this. You define the problem. You go and collect your data, and you create a vision, and you implement. It's this is still good. It's still good when we have technical problems. When we we it's we can manage it. But when it is complex and it's adaptive, it's not easy to just do this and think that we're going to Bush and Marshak, they were the ones that started the conversation on dialogic change. I then reflected on the fact that several courses that I took included dialogic change, brought the concepts of dialogic change, but they were never put together. For example, I'm a qualitative researcher. 
dialogic change, as you heard in my example of listening into the conversation in my workplace, it's about sensing, it's about interpreting, it's about being, you know, a qualitative researcher is, is always making sense of what are the major themes here? What is what is what was the message here? What are the what are the storylines? So when I reflected on my own development, I'm like, this is all has always been there, and I have been using it, but it, I never put it all in one. So something to reflect on, you know, what is? Did someone raise their hands? I'm not sure. Um, but B, you, you can tell me if someone is wants to um, ask a question or, or make a statement. Um, so plan change very still works. It works for when the problem is is not as complex, and you can you know take your data and find an intervention and implement it. COVID, like I said, was not. And so you go through the process of identifying the adaptive challenge, reframe into the possibility. And this, the reframe is the most, I think for me, it's the most powerful piece. Because if you can reframe, then you are beginning a different conversation. To reframe, it could, you can reframe, think about the marketing department. How do they engage customers to buy your product? to buy your service there's an emotion piece you know that the marketing today is more about the story and the emotion the possibility face cream for example the possibility of erasing all your the wrinkles the possibility think about that inside the organization how do you inspire engage employees to be self to self-organize to trigger, you know, a new be to, to think differently. And, 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 and as a result of that, then to enact different behaviors. You can't tell people to do that. That's not how behavioral change occurs. It has to be bottom up. And you have to help people see the possibility. You have to help, you know, they have to feel it. To do that, then we got to engage multiplicity. And we don't give them answers, but instead we give them questions and allow them to have the conversations about what could the possibilities be. So representation matters. The voice matters. And then you give them the opportunity to experiment, to try you know, what they have identified as possibilities for, for improvement, for change, and be prepared because not everything is going to be successful. Some of them will be paths to mastery. Again, another important piece for all of us, because this was also a reframing for me as a professor, how we have been raised to think about success and failure. I read this book. Uh, she's, it's written by a Harvard professor. It's called The Rise, R-I-S-E. It was powerful for me to reframe my notion around failure. Her whole emphasis is that failure are paths to mastery. So there's no perfection. So when we, you know, when there's failure or when we feel we, we did not get to, the, to that point that we perceive to be, you know, where we would have felt like we've accomplished something and we didn't get there totally, that, that pause that we had is not was not bad. It's a good thing because it's an opportunity for us to to improve, an opportunity for us to reflect on what we could do to then move to the next, you know, to get to the next stage or to get to a better, you know, outcome. So failures are paths to mastery. That was profound for me as a writer. You know, we professors have to submit papers and then we get reviews. And sometimes those reviews are not good. And then there's a mental, emotional reaction to it. But to be able to reframe the reviews in a way to that it that it could get you. And ultimately it does, because then I look at draft, you know, the draft that I submitted and then the final one, oh, what, what a major difference. 
So learning from success and failures, and then those the the, the one the, the innovations, the probes, the ideas that were presented, and the ones that that were successful, then you can scale them. That's what we do in our executive program. There are so many projects because in our executive program, you have to bring your work into the classroom and your work comes as a result in the frame of a change. But what has happened is that a lot of these, you know, change projects have not been scaled in the organization. And the reason they have been scaled is because of the language around money. Most of my students come from the private sector. So it is, it's the language around this originated as a result of the company losing money and figuring out why it was losing money and then triggering the change around that um, or building cap capacity capability in, in the organization. Um, so scale the scaling of those projects. Uh, it, one of those projects, for example, was with Chevron. Another project is now with Baker Hughes. And it doesn't always, it's not always just the HR professionals. Both the Chevron and the Baker Hughes were sales professionals who came in and were able to look at their sales organizations from an outside perspective and then trigger change internally to the point that they that their projects then were now embedded in all the sales organizations within the company because you know oil and gas has commercial and it also has retail and within those two businesses there are sales groups so th they serve different customers commercial customers sale customers uh okay I i'm seeing some comments yes Okay, yes. So so it, from an approach perspective, then, this is the generative change would be how you go about triggering change when you recognize your organization is a dialogic space and you're dealing with more of a complex, adaptive challenge where there's no easy answer for it uh, and that you need the collective intelligence um, in, inside the organization. The, I'm going to talk a little bit about this specific piece here, the reframing into possible, into the possibility. Generative image, back to marketing, you know, when, when, when you're all sitting at home watching the TV and they're selling products. The next time you sit in front of the TV, pay attention to what the image or the idea or the metaphor does to you as a customer. What does it generate? Emotion? Maybe you want to try it. Um, maybe you have already tried it and you have shared it with other people that you like the product. That's in, in your organization and implementing change. That's also what you would want your work workforce, your employees to feel. And so when we think about what a generative image does, it, it offers new and compelling alternatives to thinking and acting. From a marketing perspective, it could be offering new and compelling product for me to purchase. Um, for me to, the way I feel about, about myself, if I were to use this product, maybe the idea of getting younger, for example. But think about it. Marketing is also offering new and compelling alternatives because there's multiple products on on in the market and each company is competing for a market share share so they all have to provide compelling stories about their products same for the, inside the organization offers different conceptual and metaphoric landscape a different way of seeing the organization a different way of thinking so when we think about culture change, for example, that's transformational. Again, there is nothing we can give an employee that will trigger any form of transformation. It is when we involve them in that conversation and we help them to reflect and we help them to, to bring that collective intelligence. In that process, they're acquiring language 
And if we're able to give them a generative image that engages them, that in, allows for their emotions, their willingness, their you know, to, to be human, just to be human, to be able to give, to share, then we're allowing for that the emergence of that new way of thinking, the conceptual and metaphoric landscape. When we're able to provide a generative image, and remember that this generative image is in alignment with the second stage, reframing into the possibility. So when we're, that reframing, when we're able to reframe by presenting that generative image metaphor idea, it allows people to look at all problems in new ways. And so language, again, matters. If we go in with the deficit language, you know, we have a the word problem is a deficit. The word problem in trigger indicates that there is a gap. But if you go in and say, and for some of you, you may have already heard this concept, appreciative inquiry. If we go in with, hey, we're doing, how can we improve on what we're doing? Or how can we strengthen what we do? Those two words mean, the strengthening means there is a base here. How can we move it to the next stage? allows people to look at all problems in new ways. People want to act because of what the image or metaphor generates. Back to the whole marketing, you know, marketing wants us to buy. And subsequently, internally also, then your generative image should also trigger that want, that belief, that energy to get involved and trigger change. I want to share with you a, a short video and be, I'm not sure how much time I won't be able to share the entire video with you. It's public. I, as a, as a customer, I was actually doing a research study and I interviewed folks from this hospital, this healthcare organization. And through my conversations with them, I learned of these core values. It was amazing the stories that these employees had about how their core these core values um, showed up in their lives in this organization. Yeah, at this point, I'm not going to say anything else. I just want to hear from you. Um, you know, your takeaways, your questions. I know there's a couple comments, and you know, how does this? I recognize and acknowledge that context matters and can you apply some of the dialogic, you know, the dialogic approach to your organization? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Joe would like to have feedback, please. Consuelo, so Joe uh, is back. So actually I also have been thinking how this one can be also introduced into the private sectors. Say, for example, you say Thailand or maybe in our uh, regional context of the business. And, and any any um, yes. idea so, that popped up for I, you? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea uh, may be uh, not yet uh, very, very uh, concrete, but uh, uh, is, is a good... Uh, is a good idea and also a, a platform to start with something that the corporate world can be very much interested in this one. Uh, I believe that um, the corporate world will be looking at the tools that can help them to accelerate uh, this approach into a current uh, a practice in their organization. And actually, I'm saying this also based on the experience that I have had with the corporate sectors. So. Um, maybe something like uh, the, what is next in terms of the tools that the corporate world will be able to uh, will be to prepare for the adaptation, so to say, as you said. So I think that would be something that uh, would be uh, very uh, interesting uh, uh, amongst our HR professionals, meaning that those who are working in the in the a change in the organization's uh, organization development, for example. Yeah, and, and thank you for, for your comment. In regards to what tools, this is the cool part about dialogic change. It does not come with the prescription. The prescription does not fit because the prescription 
would then be more focused on a technical problem. But when we're dealing with adaptive complex challenges, there's no prescription as there was now with COVID. Uh, if there was a prescription, then there would have been uh, a vaccine immediately and there was none. And uh, it was a learning curve and adapting um, and, you know, the tools, the templates, everything that was used to keep us abreast and educate us on how to behave, how, you know, what to, what to do, where to go, how far should we keep apart? All of that was an emergence in many ways. Um, again, if, if, if COVID would have been a technical problem, then the healthcare systems would have been way more prepared than they were. Um, and we all learned, you know, from from the, that experience. Um, so to your point, there's no prescription. So the tools, the templates are always going to be context-based. They're always going to be emergence because the tools, the solutions will always come from the, the multiplicity of voices in your organization. And one of the first frames, you know, that we have to recognize is that everybody in that organization has the possibility of triggering great value. Whether you've been there for a day, whether you've been there for 15 years and recognizing that every individual brings something that we can uncover that we don't even know yet, that that person may have the idea or the potential way of thinking that we need to move the organization forward. So mm. it's all that will always be an emergence. Um, right. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Uh, my second point, quick point. Uh, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I can see what you mean. Uh, my uh, second point, my last quick point is about the, I don't know whether this uh, di dialogics approach can be also applied to the organization, which is now uh, more interactive with the AI, for example. Say, mm -hmm. now we are using ChatGPT, we are using Google Bot, whatsoever there. So there is a, a angle of the human and machine uh, diagnostics uh, uh, practice in the organization. So I think this yes. is something that is also good to explore. Exactly, because, um, yeah, there, there's multiplicity of experiences in, in the organization um, as a result to AI and uh, I see junior junior employees as being um, critical voices in the organization as it relates to AI. Um, you know, some people are gamers. Some people, uh, you know, they are the digital savvy um, and they may have ways of how AI can improve. But also, you know, one of the crit crit criticisms of AIs right now is context. Uh, so think, you know, Right now, we're exploring a study with Portugal and Brazil and the United States with HR professionals. And when I asked my executive HRD board if they're using AI, and some some said, "Oh yeah, I you know if I need to send a message to the employees, I you know put in the information that I want. AI produces a message, and then I come in, I I adapt that, revise it to fit for context." To your point, AI is being developed in, in the Western world. To, I mean, to, as far as I know, the, at least the ones that people are using. But isn't that language very uh, more direct language? Um, and so is AI applicable to the Thai context? That's, that's a core question. And then how do you adapt to that? So... Um, you know, AI comes with with also its challenges. So yeah, and and who knows? Uh, I just last week I saw a cheat a cheat sheet for HR professionals and all the things you could do with AI. Um, that may be contextualized to organizations, and that may require dialogue. You know, how can AI be used in the manufacturing department safely, ethically? 
Uh, how can we use AI in the engineering department? That shouldn't be just a group of people making that decision. That should be everyone that are, especially the ones that are actually doing the work to bring bring their voices into that conversation and then identify ways how the organization could use AI. So, okay. Yeah, uh, we, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let me read for you. The, this is from Mr. Keshav from AIT. In case the people and system are self-organizing, to which extent shall the manager and or leader intervene to manage the changes? And what are the points that shall be considered most? Yes. In the case where there's self-organization occurring, then the leader is a facilitator. The leader creates spaces for that dialogue to occur. For self-organizing simply means, you know, we're pooling ideas and we're making decisions and we're then creating change about how we work, how we do work. It's also occurring at the individual level. In this particular session right now, there is self-organizing happening, self-organizing in how you're thinking about the work you do, for example. Tomorrow, you may go into work and ask a question. That's self-organizing. So self-organizing could be group-oriented. It could be at the individual level. It Self-organizing can happen just by asking a question. So in regards to the leader, the, the the manager or leader with a specific group of people, it would be a creating space for dialogue. It, the interven the intervening is not to not to say here's the you know maybe it could start even from what question you know what is the question that we want to answer. Um, so it's about creating space. It's about providing resources, time. In the United States, as you know, equals money. So everybody's running out of time here. Um, so in the United States, it's to provide that space to have dialogue, to have conversations. Um, one of the the same organization in that video, one of our uh, the senior vice president is on my board, but it's also I have a couple of their employees in my program. And um, back to COVID mental health, um, there are no meetings on Wednesdays. From the president all the way down, there are nobody in that organization can hold meetings on Wednesdays. It's a meeting-free day. Um, so, you know, creating that space in, in for self-organizing. Um, I hope that I hope that helped that met. And by, the reason I was using time because time is a resource. So think about what resources your group needs to have dialogue, to come up with probes, to to identify ideas, and then providing the opportunity for that for those probes to be tested, experimented with. Did it work? It didn't work. What? How can we change it? What can we do? Um, it's yeah, the leader creates spaces by allowing people to bring the ideas and probably just asking questions or even not even asking questions, but asking what questions should we be asking? I hope that helps. Okay, uh, another question is uh, from Shaheen Hussein from AIT when it is policy, it somehow instruct and guide for changing behavior of people, which is always a challenge for development. How is an international organization strengthen its continuous growing, coping with the changing behavior of its people and system? And so they, they, they continue. So organizations are self-organizing because they're made up of us, we humans. Um, and so there is no way we can control that there is no it's recognizing it and i think the biggest thing for what the, you know for, to the point made is to, to recognize that the organization are dialogic spaces and that the minute we walk in and we say uh well let me see here i wrote it down here hold on and we say uh sawadi dong dong chao and then from there on, we move on to the next sentence that the conversations are occurring. And as a result of that, meaning making is occurring. 
and then potential change may be occurring because as, as a result of that first meeting, as soon as I said, good morning, you were, you were going to go to your office and maybe start working on priority one, but then you were told, oh, but we have a meeting that we need to go to now. And so change is starting to occur and you learned of that change trig was triggered by a conversation. Um, so there's no controlling. It's all, it's continuous. It is, um, remember, reality is being constructed by the minute. From the outside in, you know, new regulations, uh, maybe the market did not do well in Asia. Com in internally, the senior leaders are starting to adapt. Uh, and that, that, you know, whatever decisions they're making may be occurring, coming from the bottom, from the line perspective, from the bottom up, the customers are, are have voice and the customers are providing feedback and that may trigger change internally. So the organization is changing by the second and multiple forces are triggering that change. Um, and the organization that recognizes that and subsequently gives the employees agency to self-organize, gives the employees agency to have voice, to bring ideas, you know, because it, it's happening so fast now that, um, you know, there's no control in a way that you can plan when we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And as a, by, as a result of doing these things, then we're preparing the organization to compete. Um, but the customers are not waiting for a year to give their feedback. The customers are, are providing feedback as soon as they interact with your product or service. So does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. So mm -hmm. now we, we are running out of time. So uh, we will keep the question later and ask uh, Dr. Consuelo and then maybe we uh, send it back to you. So... Thank you, Dr. Consuelo, for your useful and insightful on dialogic change for HR professional. We look forward to working with you again in next uh, webinar session. And also, I would like to thank uh, to all participants who participate in this session. And please stay tuned for our upcoming webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, B. Thank you to AIT for inviting me. And I appreciate all of you that took the time out to come learn together. And uh, thank you again for all the questions and the comments. I appreciate it. Thank you.